My name is Gideon Orbach. I'm one of Dr. Weiner's associates here. I practice chiropractic. My, um, my specialty, if you will, would be adjusting hands-on adjustments of the spine, the extremities, that means feet, knees, wrists, elbows and shoulders, occasionally an ankle. Uh, I do low-tech rehab, that means we do uh, exercises that don't involve a lot of equipment, that don't necessarily involve going to the gym, using things that you might be able to already have at home or acquire cheaply and easily. Uh, I like to do my rehab from a, a brain-body reconnection perspective. We like to get people's brains and bodies talking to each other more effectively. I do, um, I do muscle release techniques, and that's a handful for one person. So. Anyhow, that's what I do. Anyhow, um, natural health is a passion of mine. I'm really glad that you guys are all here and indulging me. It, it puts me in a good mood to be in a room full of people who are interested in what we do here, what, what I do. We're going to sit here and indulge me and listen to me, give you a few more bad jokes as the time progresses, and maybe even uh, teach you something that you can take home that has a little bit of value. But anyhow, when I speak, I like to begin my talk with a, a very highly important gold standard asterisked, highlighted and starred question and that is why are we here? What are we here at the Weiner Wellness event for? Stay healthy, good, good and to be informed, excellent answers. And I'm pretty psyched because there may only be a small, thin crowd here, but um, I don't know if you guys have all heard me talk before. So I can, use, I can recycle some of my material. Why are we here? We want to be healthier. That makes perfect sense to me. There's some people in the crowd here who have been coming around for a while who are longtime patients, long-term indulgence of what we do here. I see some new faces. I'm always happy to see new faces getting involved in what it is that we do. And we're all here in some way, shape, or form because we want to be healthier. What does it mean to be healthy? Who has a definition in their mind? How would you define the word health? I practice the gotcha technique. I might call on people at random. I find myself without a volunteer. You guys, yes, please, in the back. Waking up in the morning and feeling good about yourself. I like it. That kind of entails a little bit of mind and body. A little bit of a, I feel good about myself. It's not only that my knees aren't clicking and cringing and screaming at me, but I like myself. Is that kind of what you're getting at? I like it. And, and I, like, I like baseball. I put everything in baseball terms. So from where I'm standing versus where you are, you are going to be my... Um, my left fielder, so I'll be referring to you as left field. Left field had a good answer. I'm sorry. No pain. No pain. That's good. Okay. Now, I've been doing this for a while. I, I've been doing uh, natural health in some way, shape, or form. I, I got my personal training certification in 1993. So that means I'm north of 20 years of experience of doing this in some way, shape, or form. So I have a little bit of advantage of, of thinking about this. And my definition of health is as follows. Having the ability to recognize, interact with, and adapt to your environment, both internally and ex externally. We've got to recognize our environment. We've got to be able to see what's going on. We've got to be able to understand it. And we've got to be able to conquer that environment in order to be healthy internally and externally. So let's take a moment or two and think about what is, what is our internal environment? It's, it's, certainly, it's certainly all of the, uh, the neurochemistry that involves your brain talking to your body. You guys agree with that? You can nod your heads, it's okay. Yeah. Now listen, I told you I practice the gotcha technique and I talk, call on people and I ask questions back and forth. We can have a little bit of dialogue, but if I ask a question and I say, do you agree with me? Your best bet is to nod your head, it's true. I am not standing up here giving you false information. Do not disagree with me. We want to have a conversation at Giant Eagle or Starbucks or in the parking lot. I might make stuff up just to see if I can get a laugh out of you, but I am not going to stand up here and give you false information. So when I say agree, everybody just kind of nod their heads. All right, we good with that? Good, let's move on. So, your neurochemistry 
is a big part of what goes on with your internal environment. The way your brains and your bodies talk to one another. Right? Yeah. Yep. The, brain How, the command center. The command center. Only an engineer could come up with an answer like that. How about your nutrition? How about the tasty and delicious vegan cuisine that's over there somewhere? You think that's affecting your internal environment? You better believe it. How about all the nutritional supplements that people are here shopping for? Tasting the samples, talking to Jamie and to Mike Gallagher and Dr. Weiner and everybody else who's here to help. You think those nutritional supplements are going to influence your internal environment? Absolutely. Absolutely. You better believe it. All right. Here's one of my favorite wild stories from the past. You know why it's so hard to get an appointment here? We take off on Wednesdays. We all go to Kennywood. Bet you didn't know that, did you? The whole Weiner Wellness staff, except for the person who stays here to answer the phones to say, I'm sorry, we have no openings. We're all at Kennywood enjoying ourselves, even in this weather. And some of us, some of us, you know, a few adult beverages, maybe a hot dog. You can't see it, can you? Uh -uh. You can't see Weiner Wellness people eating hot dogs, can you? We're over there at Kennywood scarfing them down. Other people, well, not so much. Anyhow, we all get on the roller coasters, and some people have in exercise, in regurgitation. You guys know what that means? Throw up. Yes, they throw up. Thank you. Thanks for your help. Um, other people, well, no, they hold on to their hot dogs for later. Maybe those hot dogs are going to wear away their digestive tracts. That beer is going to challenge their liver to uh, create havoc later in the day, later in life, at some other point. You guys follow me? Internal health. Let me ask you a real serious question here. Who do you think is enjoying better internal health? The people who had an exercise and regurgitation? And everybody else who doesn't work at the Wine and Wellness Center who happened to be at Kennywood that day was like, oh, they threw up, as one might imagine. Or do you think the people who held on to their toxins for a later date, who's enjoying better internal health? Who is recognizing their internal environment and adapting to it better? You better believe it. You Some better believe it. In the short term, but in the long term. In the short term, it's a really poor way to meet new friends at Kennywood. <laughs> you might meet the nurse at her station. That, 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 that could be fun. I don't know. <laughs> it's not my way of spending my day at Kennywood, but, but absolutely. My engineer, who I'm referring to, is my shortstop by virtue of where he's standing where he's sitting and I'm standing. My shortstop slash engineer said long term, people who had an exercise and regurgitation had better internal health, and I agree with him. Let's talk for a moment about external health. How many of you may have had an experience where you were driving along, minding your own business in moderate traffic, and some some criminal, some raging sociopath may have accelerated past you and merged back in front of you in a really tight, snug quarter. I'm pretty sure everybody's had that at least once. And you thought to yourself, how do I react to this? Well, actually, you didn't even have time to think about it. You just did. Hopefully, hopefully, you tapped your brakes and didn't have to meet that person on the side of the road after having physical contact between your vehicles, right? There was no, there was no, hmm, do I accelerate or do I brake? Or do I do nothing? Do I merge the other direction? No. Oh, I know. I know the answer to this one. I'll brake. It was just reaction, right? That's good recognition and adaptation and conquering of your external environment, right? All right. Good. Good. Now, I make a similar speech at the sale you know, every time we have a sale. And sometimes the room is packed, and sometimes I can just put my foot up on the chair. Right? It's no big deal. It's good. Now, if this room were packed right now, and my engineer, who's playing shortstop, decided he wanted to get up and get seconds of his delicious vegan cuisine, and he stood up, and he had to walk past a row of people, around through a crowd, 
and back to the food, and he didn't bump into anybody along the way. And he just made his way, nimble of foot, like, like a ballet person. Would you say, would you guys agree with me? Remember, if you agree with me, you should be nodding your heads because I'm not giving you any false information. That's a good example of being able to adapt to his external environment without bumping into anybody, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Keep working at it, my friend. Keep working at it. All right. Internal environment, external environment. This brings us to a very important vocabulary word. My shortstop slash engineer has just made his way through the crowd without bumping into anybody. Maybe he had to say excuse me a couple of times, but he was deft. He pulled it off. Very good spatial awareness. He recognized where his body was in space. You guys, you guys follow me here? Now, had he got up out of his chair, tripped over his own feet, knocked the people next to him over like dominoes, had to crawl over uh, um, to get food, knocking people over left and right the whole way, we might not be saying this. But he's a ballet man. He's deft. He's like a little... He crash into people if he had a few too many of those adult beverages. Well, we're, we're not talking about adult beverages. We'll get back to those later, I promise. <laughs> Anyhow, that's called proprioception. Proprioception is the ability to recognize your, your place in space and move your body accordingly. When we eat, and I notice a few of you are, so you'll make good examples for me, we spoon up our food or we pile it up on our fork, right? And where do we put it? In our mouth. Absolutely. Why don't we put it in our ears? That's not where it goes. There's no teeth. In okay. There. That's not where it goes. There are no teeth in the ears. Good answer. Good answer. No, no taste, the left fielder said there's no taste in your ears. Well, there are severe neurological disorders that unfortunately people suffer from where they may put their food in their ear and wonder why they're not getting any nourishment. And they might feel like, okay, well I didn't consume enough so let me put more in my ear. That would be an example of suboptimal proprioception. They're not exactly sure where in space to do what. You guys got me? Good, good. Proprioception, big time vocabulary word. Let's do another vocabulary word. Does anybody here know what the word iatrogenic means? Iatrogenic, going once, going twice. Iatrogenic means the doctor caused it. An injury that the doctor caused. This is such a common phenomenon. It happens so often that there is a word in our vocabulary for this experience. An iatrogenic injury. Oops, caused by the doctor. Now, at a wild, wild extreme case scenario, Somebody goes to the hospital because they have a severe infection in their lower leg. And the surgeon says, I'm really sorry. We have no choice but to amputate this lower leg. And the patient goes through all the protocol. They rush this person to surgery. And the doctor amputates the wrong leg. Oh. That's an iatrogenic injury. That's a pretty bad one. But I want you guys to get the picture of, you know, we're doing vocabulary words, so we might as well go to the extreme, right? Yeah. We might as well go to the extreme for the sake of learning the vocabulary, right? Okay, good. Another one. Where would somebody go to acquire a nosocomial infection? The word is nosocomial. Where would one acquire this? Absolutely. Ding, 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 ding. Your shortstop, your third base. Third baseman says nosocomial infections occur in the hospital. It happens so frequently that we have a word for it. So let me ask you guys a question here. How many of you, by a show of hands, think that when you have a health concern or a health issue, 
avoiding the hospital and the doctor, and coming to explore what options are available in natural health might be a good place to start. Excellent. We're all on the Which same page. It depends on how serious the right, condition right, is. There's right. A time and a place. I absolutely agree with that. There's always a time and a place. You're chest There's pains, you don't come here. Well, no, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to disagree with you on that one. There's some chest pains that we take care of prob probably probably the most common condition that I see uh, deal with chest pains and are caused by a hiatal hernia and lead to uh, digestive problems and breathing problems. And I wouldn't say not a day, but certainly every week. I have a patient who maybe they went to the emergency room first for uh, a diagnosis or a workup or in a state of panic. Maybe it's a good idea to go to the emergency room. It depends case by case. But that wasn't where they belonged. So we, we do take care of some pretty severe chest pains. We don't stop heart attacks in their tracks. So I'm going to qualify what you said. But there you're right. You're 100% right. There is a time and a place. But in general, almost always, I think it's a pretty good idea to start with natural health. And that's one of the big reasons why we are all here and why I'm glad to see you people. Now, I believe, I believe that the title of my talk is about dealing with exercise and repairing or reconnecting brain-body communication. Does that sound familiar? That's what you guys came to the right lecture? That's what you're expecting? Don't want you to go home dissatisfied like we had a bait and switch or anything, right? Okay, good. Let's get there. Now, the human brain processes three trillion bits of information in every split second. Three trillion bits of inf information. Okay? This is not something, once again, I don't stand here and make this stuff up. If I did, I wouldn't come up with such a big outrageous number. It sounds far-fetched. The, uh, the neuroscientists who study this sort of thing came up with this number. Three trillion, it's a lot. Of those three trillion, how many bits of information do you guys believe to be conscious, meaning that you're aware of? Maybe a third. A third, that's a very generous number. The answer is 50. 50 out of 3 trillion. That's what we're aware of what's going on. How many of you know, because we've talked about this before, because you've studied this, because you know enough about the human body, how many of you know that right now, even as we speak, your brain and your pancreas are talking to each other, and the pancreas is trying to make a decision as to how much, is now a good time to start kicking out the insulin? Uh, I got to respond to the last food that these people put into my mouth. Sh should I wait? Should I hold up and produce insulin later? Or should I do it now? What do I do? And the brain says, hang on for a minute. We'll get there. Just hold your horses. How many of you are aware that that happens? Now I do. Okay. You're aware that it happens because we talked about it, because we've over-intellectualized it, because we've made it an academic issue. How many of you can actually feel your brains and your pancre pancreas talking to one another? Uh, all right, there's one in every crowd. There's always somebody. There's always somebody who's out to prove me wrong, and I respect that. I respect, oh, she's playing with me. I have a heckler. She won't take a seat, but she'll heckle me. me okay, well, you got plenty to choose from, and you're more than welcome. I like hecklers. We always have fun. All right, so anyhow, the brain is talking to every single cell of the pancreas, and we cannot, we're not conscious of it. We know about it because we talk about it, but we don't know that it's happening when it's happening because it's something we feel, right? How many of us may have, at some point in the past, or maybe even presently, how many of us have experienced some pain? Oh, yeah. Every hand in the room goes up. That's a, that's a, <laughs> Love using that as an example. It gets everyone. All right. So what's, what's pain? Is it, is it conscious or unconscious? Unconscious. Wait a minute. You know that you're in pain, don't you? If, you're, if one is in pain, but one... We don't, no we don't know necessarily what's causing it. Okay. We might not necessarily know the cause of the pain, but we are acutely aware 
of that, oh my God, I got out of bed and man, is my knee not happy. Pain is a symptom. Trying to, your body pain, trying to tell you something. Right, right. Pain is a symptom. Pain is a messenger system. Pain is a call to action, right? How many of you have said, I'm in pain right now and I really ought to do something about this but I just have too busy a day to get to it today. Tomorrow doesn't look like there's much of a chance, but Friday I'll do something about it. And Friday comes, and Friday goes, and it doesn't hurt as badly as it did on Tuesday, and you decide it'll fix itself, and Saturday comes, and it's just a little bit better. And then from Saturday, for the next four years going forward, it varies between a little bit better, as bad as it was, and you think to yourself, four years later, man, I really should have done something about this, right? Right? Not, not a foreign experience, correct? This may not be you, but I'm sure you know somebody who's had that, right? Pain is a call to action, okay? Pain is conscious. The cause of the pain, what we're going to do to fix the pain, that might not necessarily be conscious activity. May or may not be. We'll get to that. We'll figure it out. But pain is a conscious phenomenon. So if you have 50 bits of information per second, right, and you have pain dominating your experience, that means pain might be filling up, oh, what, 31, 32 bits of information out of 3 trillion? You guys following me? So that means we have 3 trillion <coughs> minus 50. That's 2.9 with a lot of nines going forward of stuff going on neurologically, part of our internal environment that we could somehow manipulate or somehow alter or somehow influence to override the pain. You guys on board with this? Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use non-conscious activity to override conscious activity, right? And I promised we were going to do some exercising, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So what I'd like everybody to do is sit up as straight as it takes to impress your chiropractor. And if you don't have a chiropractor, I know a few that I can recommend. All right, what I want you all to do is take a deep breath in through your nose, almost like you're sniffling. I want you to Feel your torsos expanding with comfortable, delicious oxygen, and now blow it out slowly through your mouth. If I blow into the microphone, it makes a creepy noise. All right, let's do this again. Now this time, this time we're going to make it just a tiny, tiny little bit more complicated. And as you breathe in through your nose, I want you to push your bellies and your torsos and your chest out toward me. If you're sitting over there to my right against the wall, don't push it towards me. Push it towards the people at the front desk. Uh, and go ahead and inhale through your nose, pushing your torsos out without shrugging your shoulders upwards. Slow and deliberate. We're expanding like balloons and blow it out through your mouths. So far, so good. Let's do this one more time. Big deep breath in through your nose, expanding your chest cavity, and blowing out through your mouths. All right, everybody relax. Well, that was cool, wasn't it? A little bit? All right, all right. Now, every single metabolic process that goes on in the human body, conscious or unconscious, Everything that's going on inside of us, inside of our internal environments, whether we know it or not, whether we're conscious of it or not, how we react to our external environments, whether we're thinking about it or not, is oxygen dependent. The more oxygen we get into our bodies, the better we will influence our brains. Now it's time to nod your head and agree with me. All right? Now, I'm a little bit... Um, I don't know what the word is. Um, I'm a little concerned. That's a good word. I'm concerned about what I saw here. You guys took a few deep breaths. Some of you look like seasoned veterans who've been doing deep breathing exercises for quite a while, or at least as long as you've been coming to hear me talk. 
Some of you look like this is new. And I actually had to say the word relax. You guys remember that? Maybe uh, 10 seconds after we got done with the third deep breath, I said, everybody relax, right? Deep breathing should be relaxing, all right? So how many of you, how many of you may have felt just a little bit lightheaded after those three deep breaths? A, just a little bit. We're not, talking, we're not talking passing out. We're not talking crest of the roller coaster after a two adult beverages and a hot dog. We're not talking anything severe, just a moment of lightheadedness, right? A little bit. How many of you felt like you were tightening up in your shoulder blades with these deep breathing? Yeah, just a bit, just a bit. All right. Well, first of all, this deep breathing should be natural. If you hang out by the pool in the summer, I mean, if you hang out by the pool now, I mean, have at it, you'll have the whole place to yourself, but well, sure, go ahead. <laughs> But if you hang out by the pool in the summer and you see these little toddlers roaming around and they're wearing diapers that are like a size and a half too big and they're, they're just these little tiny human creatures that are just barely even formed and you watch them breathe, you see their bellies go in and out and in and out and, and their belly goes out and they fit perfectly into their diaper and then they exhale and their belly sinks in and their, their, uh, their diaper looks like it's a size and a half too big. And that's, that's natural, that's what we were designed to do. But somewhere along the line, we lost that. Now, you know, uh, look, our culture is pretty, uh, it's pretty fast paced. Uh, everybody's worried about, uh, do I have enough of this? Do I have enough of that? Am I keeping up with the neighbors? Why do they have more than me? Where's my next meal coming from and how quickly can I get it? And am I providing for my family? And, and oh my God, the tension, right? You, that's kind of where we're at, kind of where we're at. And at some point between the time when you were a toddler roaming the pool in a diaper that may or may not have fit and the present time, We've pretty much lost that deep breathing mechanism, that deep breathing apparatus, and most of us breathe from about right here, right? You guys, you guys on board with me here? Yeah. And we're shallow with it. We're real shallow breathers. And we develop tightness in these muscles here in the front of our neck that attach to the top of our rib cage that are behaving like a pulley system to, to lift our rib cages up as we breathe which should really be a natural thing coming from our diaphragm. When we stick our chests out, that means they can't come up and our bellies start to expand and our diaphragm starts to push and pull our rib cage and these, these muscles here that tighten don't. And these muscles start to tighten and, and maybe they restrict circulation and maybe they uh, trigger other muscle spasms throughout the neck and next thing you know, patient has a few headaches and believe it or not, believe it or not, this is not just a nutrition store, it's a chiropractic clinic as well. And these are the kind of things that we see a lot of patients for. So what I want to do is one more time, I want to work on this deep breathing drill. And I want everybody to inhale through their nose like they're sniffling and pulling in as much air as they can, pushing their torso and their belly out toward me or out toward the wall over there and take a big deep breath in. And you should literally feel this area relaxing as you breathe and blow it out through your mouths. Big deep breath in, good. And we're holding it for a split second and blow out through your mouths. All right, everybody relax, good, good. Anybody sitting in the crowd wanna offer their feedback after a couple of deep breaths? Okay, good, good. You're activating your diaphragm muscle, which is something that you are probably not used to doing. If I, if, I, um, if I go out and do some vigorous physical work that I'm just not used to, I'm like, oh my God, my, my hips don't like this. My, my thighs do not want to be lifting this weight, right? It's activated, I feel it. It might even feel like a little bit of a strain at first. But what happens, what happens if I do that vigorous physical activity several times a week for months on end, all of a sudden my body starts to crave that activation? You, you know, I, I think you know what I mean. I'm just gonna, I'm sorry? You get used to it. You get used to it. You're never gonna crave shoveling snow. Not gonna happen. But my body is gonna crave the activity, right? It's feed me, right? So, if I asked all of you to sign up for the gym 
and go get on a program where you're going to ride the uh, elliptical or the bike for 20 minutes to warm up, lift weights for 45 minutes, and then go do a cool down in the pool, I think you would have a real good case to say, Orbach, I just, I don't have the time, and I can't do that. It sounds great. I can't do that. Create the time for me, and I will, right? Something like that. If I said to you, how about three to five deep breaths a minimum of five times a day? Those three deep breaths should take you a minute, a minute and a half if you're breathing real slowly like you should. Sound about right? So I'm going to ask you to contribute, let's say, a grand total of 10 minutes a day spread out in dosages of deep breathing exercise to contribute to your own well-being, to make an investment in your own better health. You guys think you can indulge me and do that for yourselves? All right, beautiful, beautiful. Now we touched on this for a second. This oxygen is critically important. What's going on here? It's part of the fuel for our brains. And as, uh, as I think we went over uh, uh, probably too briefly, your brain is processing three trillion bits of information in a given second. Wouldn't you want to feed your brain the oxygen component of what it needs to be a little bit more effective, a little bit more efficient, enjoy a little bit of better internal recognition of your environment, adaptation to that environment, overcoming that environment? Give yourself the tools. Give yourself the tools to do that. And, and I'll be the last one to deny how important all the nutrition is. The nutrition is critically, critically important. But we got to get oxygen, too. we got to get some, some activation here. All right? So far, so good? Good. All right. Spoken like a true engineer and a ballet dude and a shortstop. All right. Good. So we're good so far. Now... Some of you took that deep breath and felt a tightness between your shoulder blades. Maybe a little bit of tension in muscles that are just not used to doing this sort of thing. Uh, I love shameless self-promotion. You guys are people who should probably see a chiropractor, and I, I know a few. All right. Should we do another one? Let's shift gears here. I want everybody to stand up. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to stand in such a way that our feet are as close together as they possibly can be without touching each other. We good? I can't see all your feet, but I'm going to take you at your word that they're close together and not touching. And what we're going to do is we're not exactly going to stand on our tiptoes, but we're going to lean forward so that all of our weight is on the balls of our feet. And, and maybe if somebody came behind you and gave you just a tiny little tap, you might flip forward, right? So our balance is skewed, and now what we're going to do is we're going to rock backwards and do the exact opposite so that our weight is on our heels, and our toes might be on the ground, they might be hovering just above, but, but they're, they're close enough that we can call them on the ground, weight's on our heels, right? Now, we're going to rock forward just a little bit, and we're going to rock backwards and do that again. All right, everybody have a seat. All right. So that was also pretty cool, right? Uh, I know that if uh, people, with a, people with a dance background are looking at me like, come on, let's get to something a little more challenging. Other people are saying, how could something so simple be so disruptive to my equilibrium? And I'm sure that all of you fit somewhere on that spectrum. So what's going on here with this exercise? Remember a moment or two, well, more than a moment or two, but uh, earlier this morning, we talked about my, uh, my engineer slash ballet dude slash shortstop getting up and walking through the crowd without touching anybody, going to help himself some food, and making his way back to his seat with the deft precision movements of an iguana. We talked about that, right? Yeah. Right? Good proprioception. What if our proprioception, the ability to recognize our position in space, really isn't that good? What if we should be doing some exercises to stimulate it? I think this one, the rocking back and forth from toes to heel, would be a pretty good place to start. All right. Now, 
This study was done at a senior center in Rochester, Minnesota. Mayo Clinic, right? Mayo Clinic's in Rochester, Minnesota. Pretty serious uh, allopathic center. They do some good stuff there. And what we're trying to learn is who is at a risk to fall? Everybody's concerned about falling. Rochester, Minnesota, if you don't know, let me be the first to inform you. They get a lot of snow and ice. <laughs> the weather is not friendly there. We're talking about residents uh, of a senior center geriatric home, people who are doubly concerned about falling. And the researchers are trying to figure out what, what predisposes somebody, who's at a greater risk, who is more likely to slip on the ice than the others, who's less likely. And they did x-rays and MRIs and cat scans and dog scans and for those of you paying close attention, they did grocery scans. And they couldn't come up with any characteristic, they the researchers that is, these people who have MDs and PhDs after their name, and they found one test, one test and one test only, that was highly predictive of who was gonna be able to maintain their balance and who was the biggest threat to fall, and that test was this, the ability to stand on one foot for 10 seconds. You know what, <laughs> we could have known that, we could have done that right here at the Weiner Wellness Center and generated the same results and saved them tens of millions of dollars. We could have eliminated all the grocery scans and figured that one out, right? So with that in mind, it's, uh, um, it's December in Pittsburgh, right? It's not Rochester, Minnesota. I think we've been pretty lucky not to have any real snow accumulation thus far this year. We do have hills. Well, we have hills, absolutely. Yeah, we do get some icy sidewalks. You're absolutely right, and you're following right along with me as I come to my point. This is a harsh environment. It's not Rochester, Minnesota, but I promise you, I promise you this. Over the course of the winter, I will see patients who come to see me and say, I've fallen on the ice. Happens every year without fail. So what I would really, really like, <laughs> we have a living testament. <laughs> what I would really, really like is if going forward, my living testament and the rest of you said to yourselves, you know that little rocking back and forward exercise that Orbach talked about during the sale on that comfortable Tuesday in early December? I think I'm gonna invest three or four minutes a day just doing that drill and, and stimulating my, the balance centers of my brain and uh, working on my own proprioception and making myself less of a risk to fall on the ice this winter. You guys get my point? At what point in this lecture, class, conversation, interaction, have I suggested that all of you need to go join a gym, pay $49.95 a month for unlimited access, invest two hours a day, a minimum of four days a week to get some benefit out of the exercise? It's only in jest. Uh, okay, only in jest. I don't even think that I suggested it. I implied that it was a possibility. I was, there, was, there were no doctor's orders to do that, right? right? No scripts. No scripts. But so far, we've been over two exercises that you do in your bedroom, in your living room, uh, while you're waiting in your cubicle, in your office, while you're waiting for your appointment at the Weiner Wellness Center, in line at the grocery store, anywhere, right? So far, so good? I'm asking you people, all of you, to make a very minimal investment in yourselves and some well-being here. You guys want to do another exercise with me? Yeah. All right, good. So everybody sit up straight and tall again, please. And what I want you to do is squeeze your shoulder blades behind you as tight as you can. And just because you can't move your shoulders back any further does not mean that you can't squeeze harder. So hold that tough, a thousand and one, a thousand and one and a half and relax. Let's do that again. Everybody squeeze super tight. 
1,001, 1,002, and relax. Let's talk about the mechanics of what's going on here with that squeeze, right? There's a, um, you got your spine. It's that, it's that um, slinky looking series of bones in the midline of your body and your torso, right? You guys all got a picture of your spine and where it is. Then you got your head. It's the melon that sits on top of that slinky, right? And that slinky is actually kind of like a, a spring-loaded shock absorber, right? So it compresses and it expands. And you guys think I'm being a little bit trite and silly calling it a slinky of a bone. It is a slinky. It's like a big shock absorber. It's a spring. It opens and closes. It compresses and it expands in order to dissipate shock to protect the contents of that melon sitting on top, okay? Well, the contents of that melon, that's pretty important stuff. That's critically important, that's your brain, right? Yes, left field. Yes, it does. Excellent observation and we're gonna get to that right now. The comment from left field said, sometimes it feels like a bowling ball. Now, I am going to, um, I'm going to play the mind reader game here, so you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the implication was that that head gets heavy. Is that about right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, why, why, would it, why would it get heavy? Well, the, the spine is not exactly holding it up by itself. It has a little help. There's some muscles involved. There's some connective tissue. There, there, there's some ligaments. Ligaments connect bone to bone. Tendons connect muscle to bone. And all these anatomical structures are at play, working together to hold that melon up, and it's balanced on top of the spine, right? Okay, we guys good with that so far? Yep. So, with, with apologies to you, I'm gonna turn so you guys can see my profile for a second, all right? What if, what if, now here's, here's, my, here's my melon on top of my spine, okay? My melon is on top of the, the slinky. What if I'm like this? What if, I, what if my head comes forward a little bit and it's just off in space somewhere? You guys see where I'm going with this? You guys got a visual now? Stress, stress in the top of the spine. Right, exactly. And the muscles. Now you're on to it. Now you got it. We're taking, we're taking that melon that should be balanced on top of the slinky and we're sliding it forward and we're straining muscles and connective tissue and ligaments and tendons and challenging those body tissues to pull the melon backwards, right? right. Now, you guys, I would, I would be so bold as to guess, to venture the guess that all of you at some point have either worked in front of the computer, sat on the couch watching TV, sat at the dinner table, um, that's enough, dinner table, couch TV, computer or driving, and your head drifted forward like so to uh, get yourself closer to whatever it was you were uh, endeavoring in. Yeah. I'm sure that all of you had that experience at least once, at least once, all right? <sighs> at least once is a really conservative guess. Most people are doing that posture for hours over the course of the day, for hours, okay? So we have these tremendous torques or these asymmetrical pullings as our head come forward and our anatomical structures are pulling backwards and now we're having a wrestling match and we, we the further forward the further forward the melon comes the more those muscles have to work to pull it back yeah. which makes the melon feel heavy heavy okay so without without addressing the melon component Let's talk about the muscles that are gonna support and stabilize what's going on here. As we squeeze our shoulder blades backwards, what do you think is relaxing? The muscles. The, the yeah, yeah. What do you think is strengthening? Oh yeah. So we have, we have a group of muscles. As I squeeze my shoulder blades backwards, it becomes very difficult to allow my melon to drift forwards. Very difficult indeed. Because, I, and, and what I'm doing in the process is the muscles that are gonna be pulling me forward, they're becoming relaxed, and the muscles that are gonna stabilize the melon are strengthening. All right, now once again, this is a chiropractic clinic besides being a nutrition <laughs> store. 
and I, I have it. I have it on good authority, I have it on excellent authority, take my word for this, that the chiropractors here occasionally treat patients who have headaches and very bad posture. And their heads have drifted forward and they may not be so um, cavalier in saying, my head feels heavy, but that's what they're getting at. All right, I have a pretty good authority that this happens. So what we wanna do is we wanna have an exercise that reverses those torques or pullings and strengthening, strengthens muscles that are becoming weaker, overly stretched, and gives the tight musculature a chance to relax to create stability between uh, the melon and the slinky. We good with that? So once again, let's, let's talk about these investments in ourselves, all right? Let's think about devoting five minutes three times a day grand total of 15 minutes a day, sum total, divided into equal dosages. A few deep breaths. What's a few mean? A minimum of three, maximum of 10. You'll do it again later in the day. Three to 10 deep breaths. Stand up, spend about 30 seconds to a minute, rocking back and forth. I'm on my toes. 1,001, 1,002, back to my heels, 1,001, 1,002, just rocking back and forth. And let's spend a similar amount of time as we spent rocking. I'm squeezing my shoulder blades as tight as I can behind my back. I'm holding at 1,001, 1,002. I'm pinching so hard it's to the point that it hurts. Relax and do it again. You guys cool with that? Do you guys understand not only how to do the exercises, but the benefits? Excellent. Well, I want to wrap it up here because this is going to leave just enough time for a little bit of question and answer before I see my next round of patients. So if I have left any ambiguities, now is the time to call me out on them. If you have anything else that's pertinent that you want to ask, go right ahead. If it's not pertinent, ask anyway. I'm sorry, left field, what's up? Mm -hmm. All right, the question is, if I kind of tip my head this way and I give it a little bit of a push and I want to feel a stretch on the opposite side, is, is that good? And, and the answer is yes, that is good. It's a, it's a really, really good stretch. Uh, it's a nice way to loosen up your neck. Uh, but as with any stretch or with any exercise, there's an element of, this might be too much, this might be too far. So you have to be able to recognize in your body the difference between a stretch, an intense stretch, and where did it just start to hurt. And if you're working up until that point where you say this just started to hurt, you're doing, you're doing yourself a really good thing, okay? Anybody else? The question is putting a board underneath the mattress no, or, 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 mattress. or a stiff mattress. I, I am a proponent of sleeping on the firmest mattress that you can possibly get a good night's sleep on. Now, I understand, I've never slept on a sleep number bed, but I understand that you can adjust it in such a way that it ranges from really soft to really firm. And we could put it, we could put it on the firmest possible setting, lie down on it, and it wouldn't really feel much different than lying on the concrete. You're not gonna get a good night's sleep with that, it's counterproductive. So I'm gonna scale it down to the highest setting, the most firm, that I feel like I can comfortably sleep on. And uh, then uh, somebody is gonna go take a nap in my bed and they're gonna say, Warbach, you're such a wimp. I turned that thing up like 30 points and slept like a baby. So there's an element of subjectivity here. It's not, it's not like there's an absolute number that's a right answer for everybody. The right answer is gonna vary. But, but we wanna lean towards more firm, not more soft. Yeah, well, I didn't get one in time, so. <laughs> yes, please. 
the question is the right position for your head when you're sleeping. And, and once again, this is going to have a little bit of individual variance and subjectivity, but I say as flat as possible such that you are comfortable. Some people are, some people are going to prop themselves up with six pillows appropriate for the Queen of England. And they're going to sleep soundly through the night, and they're going to wake up feeling great, and they are going to blow my theory to smithereens. All right, there's one in every crowd. There was that woman over here who heckled me and didn't pull up a seat. All right, it is what it is. But in general, the flatter the pillow, the flattest possible pillow that you can get a comfortable night's sleep is the right answer to maintain the integrity of the uh, slinkiness of your neck. Okay, the question was um, the pillows that we carry in the back that have the contour to them. Um, the contour means that the part of your head that's actually resting is uh, uh, actually pretty flat, and the, 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 the concavity and the convexity of the pillow is uh, uh, like, a, like a support. So I, 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 I see merit to them on an individual basis depending on what your neck is doing, but for other people, they're really it's going to be like sleeping with a neck brace. Well, you guys have been fun. You guys have been a lot of fun. Yes, left field. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know how to respond to that. I, well, I like to scare people. I like to. Uh, thank you. I, I, I like to scare people. I like to walk around with a scowl and see, and, and see like, all right, I'm going to weed a lot of people out this way. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, anyhow, you guys have been a lot of fun. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate that you guys are interested in natural health. Um, and save your seats because Dr. Weiner is going to speak in a few minutes. And, you know, he usually packs them in, so it should be fun.